end. Please go ahead and raise your hand um, and we'll call on you and, and unmute and ask your questions to facilitate mm -hmm. a conversation. So Peter, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you again for, for presenting. Thanks, uh, Brad and Terry, for inviting me to, to talk today. I hope my screen looks okay. Yeah, everything's perfect. You can hear me. So, uh, uh, sure can, just a... If you guys can mute yourself too, please, um, except for Peter, of course. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm sure it's just a coincidence I'm asked to present on April Fool's Day, but uh, I hope you take our data somewhat uh, seriously. And, and also, this is a bit of a work in progress. So uh, uh, I think uh, I'd be happy to hear feedback on, on what we've been doing. So what we've been trying to do here is to um, look at the other genes that have been associated with, with ADPKD, try to determine um, whether they're significantly associated with cis development and, and what the penetrance of those disorders might be. Okay, so uh, I think most of you are pretty familiar with ADPKD. This is a very uh, common uh, monogenic disease, a common cause of uh, kidney failure. I will try to eat and watch and watch it. Can you please, can you please mute yourself, Yun? Thank you. Yeah, I think for about 5% uh, of individuals with uh, uh, kidney failure, renal failure, in the in the US, uh, and it's a progressive disease that uh, develops over the lifetime of the patient with an average age of of kidney failure around uh, sixty years of age. So uh, the uh, PKD one, the, oh, the I think uh, Rachel sent it in Slack. The most common gene has been uh, um, identified about thirty years ago. Uh, this accounts for about 78% of a um, well-characterized ADPKD population. It encodes a rather large uh, transcript here. Uh, and uh, part of that transcript, two-thirds of it at least, is within a duplicated region of the genome, which makes uh, screening for variants a little bit more uh, complex. Than... And then, uh, so I think we were discussing uh, PKD1 within the a duplicated region and how that makes it more complicated to find uh, variants and uh, and capture methods, uh, capture next generation sequencing methods, I think uh, work well, um, but there's still some regions like very GC rich regions or regions that uh, match the pseudo genes very closely that may not be very well represented. PKD2 is a more uh, conventional gene uh, with a 3KB uh, opening reading frame. As I mentioned, I'm going to talk about some of the other loci that have been associated uh, with ADPKD. So just as a kind of background about that, a couple of years ago, we identified that a, a cilial protein, IFT140, can uh, be associated with an ADPKD phenotype. Interestingly, this protein is just about half a megabase away from uh, PKD1 itself on chromosome 16. Um, it's part of the IFT-A uh, complex, and uh, biallelic variants are associated with a ciliopathy, uh, short rib thoracic dystrophy. In this study, we're able to find quite a large number of families with variants in this, uh, this gene. If we, and we can see that they have a fairly uh, characteristic phenotype here with rather small number of, of large cysts. And from the limited family of data that we had in this paper, it seemed like there was a fairly high level of uh, penetrance of uh, the variants within uh, particular families. Whether variants in PKD1 in particular, which can co-segregate with this gene through even large families, act as some type of modifiers, I think is still an, an open question. We were also able to use some uh, large um, population databases to uh, look at the um, lightly um, 
significance of IFT140 as a um, ADPKD gene and using the UK Biobank, we were able to show that it was the likely the the, the third most common uh, cause of, of polycystic kidney disease. And it was enriched in uh, uh, ICD um, in um, selected populations for ADPKD, uh, for cysts of the kidneys, and interestingly for a later stage uh, um, CKD, although it's not normally associated with CKD, but not other uh, codes that are less uh, le related to ADPKD. Recently, we've been doing a study looking at ALG8 and ALG9 through a multi-center collaboration. Uh, as you might know, ALG8 uh, has been associated with uh, polycystic liver disease and uh, have been enriched in ADPKD populations. And ALG9 has been uh, associated with ADPKD, but we wanted to get a, a better idea of the of the the phenotype and the frequency of this disease. <clears throat> so in this multi-center collaboration, we identified 51 ALG8 and 23 ALG9 families. We also followed up by looking at the um, genome project in the in the UK as well as the UK uh, biobank here and a Mayo Clinic biobank that I'll talk more about and identified some patients within. Um, cystic populations that were found within these uh, within these biobanks. If we look at uh, ALG8, we can see we've we identified a limited number of families with multiple affected individuals. We can see here that the cystic disease is not very severe uh, in this family in particular. Quite a lot of exophytic uh, uh, cysts are, are identified. <clears throat> Um, but we were able to show segregation in, in more than one individual in these uh, different families. Uh, P907 um, is interesting. This was an originally identified family unlinked to uh, PKD1 or PKD2 uh, described from Spain. And we were able to find this ALG8 uh, frame shifting change segregating with the disease in the family. You can see in this family here and in this one here, we've also found other variants that may be significant in terms of uh, modifying the, the phenotype. For ALG9, we also identified a number of families, including this large family from Mayo that uh, was also by linkage analysis many years ago, unlinked to PKD1 and PKD2 can see the disease is pretty mild in uh, these individuals uh, with a few uh, cysts mainly in the in the um, in the kidney here interestingly the individual with quite uh, large cysts in the kidney and this uh, unusual uh, presentation here was found not to have a changes in in ALG9 so i think it shows the the complication of uh, looking at uh, linkage and segregation with these uh, genes that have a, a, a milder um, presentation of the disease. We've also been able to look in the Genomes, Genomics England project for this and been able to show in the uh, PKD population here that was not resolved with PKD1 or PKD2 changes, that ALG8 loss of function changes were enriched compared to the rest of the population, and likewise for ALG9. And then if we look at uh, patients in the UK Biobank that were selected as being ADPKD, we can see that they were also enriched for loss of function changes in the ALG8, as was the less specific uh, cysts of the kidney code. And this was even clearer here with the rarer ALG9. Uh, So now we're in a situation where we have at least eight genes as well as um, PKD1 and PKD2 associated with an ADPKD phenotype. Some of these I just discussed, 
Uh, GANA was the first uh, other ADPKD gene with cysts in the kidney and liver uh, characteristics of the phenotype. DNA JB11, where the kidneys stay rather small, become fibrotic, but kidney failure, similar to P uh, the age of PKD2, is seen. Um, ALG5, which has been described in a limited number of families, which also may be a cystic fibrotic phenotype. Suggestion recently that ALG6 might also be associated with cysts in the kidney. And the description last year of uh, mono monoallelic changes in neck aids, uh, specific missense changes within the kinase domain uh, can be associated with childhood uh, kidney failure. But the question is, what's the, the penetrance of these uh, different phenotypes and how much of the ADPKD population do they make up? If we look here at the, at the different uh, genes um, that have been suggested, also added monoallelic uh, PKHD1, the, the ARPKD gene on, on this list, they're divided up into the major genes here. The minor genes, but where there's uh, strong evidence, and we've used um, uh, ClinGen here as a, a way of, of uh, determining the strength of the uh, evidence, uh, these uh, genes have been categorized in this group, but there's still some groups, including ALG8, ALG6, and PKHT1, where, where the evidence of um, whether they're really associated with a cystic phenotype. And certainly for all of these, what the penetrance of the disease is, is still a little unclear. So how can we uh, prove the disease association and determine the, the clinical phenotype and penetrance of proposed ADPKD genes? So, we can look at their frequency in defined ADPKD cohorts, and we can also look at clinical uh, the clinical phenotypes of carriers of known pathogenic variants in large populations. In these populations, we need to have good clinical, radiological, and uh, a genomic sequence data to, to get meaningful information. If we look at um, a combination of the HALT uh, clinical trial population and the CRISP observational trial population, uh, this is kind of up-to-date published information. We can see about 80% are accounted for by PKD1 truncating or PKD1 non-truncating changes, about 15% between PKD2 truncating and non-truncating around 4% are still unresolved. And we can see that we have a smattering of these, uh, uh, some of the other genes that I mentioned here found in, the, in this population, as well as uh, col collagen 4A4, um, which normally associated with Alport syndrome, but uh, there have been some recent uh, descriptions of, of cysts as a, uh, one of the major phenotypes that can be seen. And the HANAC collagen gene here, which also there's a limited evidence that it can be sometimes associated with more of a cystic phenotype. For the population data, we've used the Mayo Clinic Biobank. This is a, a, a biobank of around uh, 53,000 uh, patients uh, collected mainly from the Northern uh, Midwest, as well as some from Florida here uh, and uh, here, we have uh, DNA, and now we have uh, sequence data through this uh, uh, collaborative project uh, through whole exome sequencing of this population. Importantly, we also have access to clinical records and imaging on these patients. Uh, the patients had to be 18 years of older for enrollment. Uh, we can see this is a pretty old population, 43% are over 65 with an average age of uh, 60.7. Uh, there's a bit of a preponderance of females within the population and reflecting uh, where it was uh, collected, it's uh, uh, um, also predominantly white population. So we've used uh, both a phenotype first and a genotype first approach here, 
Um, so he, with a phenotype first approach, we're using ICD codes to identify um, uh, cohorts with uh, ADPKD, PKD, or uh, or a liver or cis. Then we review the, the, the their medical records. Um, we retrieve the imaging data and the clinical information on here and, and recharacterize them to some extent based on that, and then look at the uh, genotype of this population. In the genotype first approach, we look at genes that uh, we think might be associated with ADPKD or uh, ADPLD. We identify patients with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in these from the sequence data. And again, review the patient data to look at the uh, cystic phenotype and examine the relationship uh, with these particular genes. So these are the ICD uh, codes that we've used to uh, identify the, the phenotype uh, first uh, population. We can see with these codes about, uh, these are both for uh, cysts in the liver and cysts in the kidney. In this, we can see about 2.1% of all uh, uh, patients within the, the population were uh, uh, positive for one of these codes. Uh, there was 185 that were positive for uh, ADPKD uh, phenotype, although we reduced this to 156 after analyzing them in more detail. And here we didn't use the cysts of the kidney uh, uh, code um, because this brought up a, a very large number of individuals within the population. If we look at the ADPKD uh, cohort, we can still see that uh, many less of them are resolved than in our uh, clinical cohorts. And that's probably because they involve uh, rarer cases. Also, we're dealing with fairly low read um, uh, whole exome sequencing data um, um, where not all PKD1 changes, for instance, may be identified, and we're resequencing these individuals. But you can see that PKD1 uh, truncating and non truncating are counting uh, for about 37% of this population, PKD2 about 13%, and then other genes about 12% of this population. We can see that the frequency of ADPKD from this population is, is pretty high. Maybe that's because patients with PKD uh, come for, to uh, Mayo Clinic, but I think it's also perhaps reflecting that we're sometimes underestimating the frequency of ADPKD. And even if we limit that to PKD1 and PKD2 cases, we can see the frequency is pretty high. If we look at the other genes that have been identified, we have ALG8, GANAB, IFT140, and PKHD1, as we discussed. Uh, two, two genes associated with uh, Alport syndrome and the HANEC gene. We also have NOTCH2 here, which is associated with a more syndromic disease, but was initially identified as an ADPKD population in this, in this cohort. And then IFT140, another um, uh, cilial gene, which we found uh, three cases in here, suggesting it might also be uh, an ADPKD-associated gene. If we look at the, uh, the, the, the uh, phenotype in these individuals, we can see that they match what we're expecting with PKD1 truncating, more severe than PKD1 uh, non-truncating. Uh, next, we see the PKD2 cases. We can see for the other genes, they are over a range here, but generally associated with mild disease. And the unresolved cases we can see are over quite a right long range, wide range there, uh, reflecting that some are probably still PKD1 uh, uh, cases, whereas others uh, may be either uh, uh, other genes or um, uh, uh, cases with not genetic forms of, of ADPKD. We look at the EGFR, we can see a similar situation here with the patients with uh, kidney failure, mainly the PKD1 truncating, but some non-truncating and a few PKD2. Uh, um, we still have some uh, 
uh, unresolved patients with quite se severe uh, disease here, maybe uh, miss PKD1 changes, but the majority are in the milder phenotype, milder cohort here. And we can see that the other genes are also mainly focused in this uh, milder end of the, of the cohort. If we look at the size of the kidneys, we can also see the ones with the large kidneys are mainly the PKD1 uh, changes, both truncating and non-truncating, but also uh, some PKD2 and some of the other genes are also have uh, pretty large uh, kidneys. So what we're trying to do now is to uh, finish up the genetic analysis of this cohort, as well as looking uh, at patients that have been pulled out um, with the ICD codes uh, for milder forms of PKD to see how many of those are associated with uh, known and uh, maybe unknown uh, PKD genes. We look at some examples from here, you can see a truncating PKD1 case with large cystic kidneys, non-truncating in the similar case. A PKD1 case that it seems to be a mosaic with maybe a little milder, milder disease. PKD2 individual illustrated in the large kidneys that we can have in these patients. But here we can see a, a collagen 4A4 case with uh, several large uh, uh, cysts within the, within the kidney. GANAB with a, a characteristic a mild cystic uh, um, kidney disease. Not much evidence of liver cysts, maybe one or two here. You can see one of the IFT172 cases here with a phenotype that looks somewhat similar to what we see in IFT140. And here's the NOTCH2 uh, case here, uh, which was uh, originally diagnosed with 80 PKD. And you can see most multiple cysts within the kidney looking like 80 PKD at uh, just 25 years of age. So now let's get on to the, the genotype first uh, analysis. So here we started by looking at PKD1 and PKD2 um, <laughs> cases with truncating variants. We found what appeared to be 50 within the, within the, the population. 41 of these overlap with the cohort I just showed you. Two others seem to have a, a, a clear ADPKD phenotype, but we missed them from the... Uh, phenotype first approach, but seven patients didn't seem to have an ADPKD phenotype. When we looked at them in more detail, we can see one of them was this uh, nonsense mutation here. We can see that uh, in cysts with that, there's another missense change, and, uh, and the uh, combination of these actually results in a missense change rather than a, than a nonsense mutation. Uh, likewise, for this TRIP uh, nonsense variant, there's also another missense change in the same uh, in cyst with this change, and then again uh, resulting in a missense change rather than uh, a nonsense variant. And then closer to the end of the gene, there's a larger uh, deletion here of 11 base pairs, but we can see that there's another single uh, um, nucleotide um, deletion close by here. And the combination of these uh, results in an in-frame uh, indel of a, a deletion of this region, and then insertion of a couple of amino acids, which seems to be probably uh, uh, also a benign change. And we can see that these are some of the most uh, common apparent loss of function variants that we see in, in NOMAD. So if we take those ones out, we can see we have uh, um, uh, truncating variants in about one in 1,238 individuals in Mayo Clinic Biobank, and all of those have a, an ADPKD phenotype. Likewise, for the PKD2, uh, we have a frequency of truncating variants, about one in 4,000, and they also have an ADPKD phenotype. So from the analysis we've done so far, looking at truncating changes, they associate, they seem to be having a fully penetrant uh, uh, phenotype. We still need to look at uh, uh, missense changes, and we're trying to look at a bona fide list now of, of uh, missense changes within the, within the biobank. 
If we go to IFT 140, we can see that 85 patients had truncating changes within the biobank. So this is pretty common. Um, so uh, suggesting that it's not going to be a fully penetrant phenotype, otherwise we'd see it very commonly. We can see here for EGFR that these patients mainly have conserved uh, kidney function. Uh, if we look at the ones with imaging, we can see, or if we look with ICD codes, 10 of the 43 that had imaging uh, had uh, renal uh, had ICD codes for renal cysts, including two in the ADPKD uh, population, and and most of them had uh, either kidney or or liver cysts, uh, and uh, but only 21 percent of them had more than 10 cysts. But we can see here a plot looking at some of the larger cysts, knowing that. IFT140 is associated with larger cysts. So we can see uh, multiple cysts in some of these uh, individuals, but we can also see that, it, that in some we don't see any larger cysts. And if we look at a couple of uh, images from them, we can see here a couple of characteristic patients with uh, IFT140 uh, large cysts within the kidneys, as we normally expect. But then we can see some other individuals with just a very small number of cysts here in the in the kidney and the liver. So it it, it appears that uh, the phenotype here for IFT one hundred and forty is is not con completely uh, penetrant. We also looked at the ALG eight and ALG nine in the whole Mayo Clinic Biobank. Uh, uh, population uh, identified 70 individuals with ALG8 loss of function changes and 16 uh, with ALG9, and 49 of these had imaging for ALG8 uh, and 10 for ALG9. And uh, so this is showing again the frequency of loss of function uh, or lightly pathogenic uh, pathogenic changes to. ALGA in particular in the whole population again is is very high, uh, suggesting a, a, a penetrance of a phenotype that's not going to be uh, complete. If we look at the the number of cysts that we find uh, here, we can see that there are multiple cysts both in the the kidney and in the liver in these patients. But again, there's a group of patients here. Uh, that don't have cysts. Nevertheless, when we looked at a, a control population, we could saw that there was uh, um, both the presence of cysts and the number of cysts in the kidney and the liver were significantly higher in the ALG8 uh, compared to the control uh, population. And 38% of these uh, patients have more than uh, 10 kidney cysts. One variant, uh, this uh, apparent typical splicing change was found uh, quite commonly in NOMAD and was common in our uh, Mayo Clinic Biobank uh, population, much more common than found in our clinical population, and uh, suggesting that this may not be a fully penetrant uh, uh, change. Uh, and if we remove that, we can see that uh, uh, the, the typical number of cysts is, is, or the number of individuals with cysts is higher um, in the other variants compared to um, compared to ALG, compared to uh, what we find with this change, where half of the patients didn't have cysts within the kidney. And if we look at the number of cysts with this particular variant, it's much lower than we find in the and the other parent. So. Uh, uh, questioning whether this is really a pathogenic change. If we look at uh, ALG9, uh, we can see we have a, a lower number of patients here, but many of them have uh, cysts within the within the kidney uh, or the liver. But here, probably because of the small number, uh, uh, small size of the population, we didn't find a, a, a significantly larger number of cysts in the in the kidney or the liver, although they were trending to uh, close to significant for both of those populations. If we look at the, the whole of the ALG8 uh, uh, population in terms of uh, kidney function, 
when this is looking at the red dots here, we can see uh, mainly preserved re kidney function, although there are some patients with a decline in uh, kidney function. Uh, and if we compare with the ALG uh, patients found in Mayo Clinic Biobank, we can say that they have a little bit milder phenotype. And I think this is to be expected where we uh, select patients from a, a clinical cystic population that we might expect them to have more severe disease. And then if we look at the size of the kidneys, we can see in the AOAG8 patients, they're not hugely enlarged and not increasing in size uh, much over time, but they are a little bit larger in the clinical population than the Mayo Clinic Biobank population. If you look at ALG9, the, the, the clinical function is a little bit more variable with more patients with a decline in, in kidney uh, function here, although not true of all of the patients uh, within, the, within the cohort. And for the, the Mayo Clinic uh, Biobank ones, again they, again, they tend to have a little bit milder uh, disease. Uh, the, the size of the kidney is a little bit larger in our ALG9 uh, cohort here, and the clinical cohort, but again, made up of patients with uh, uh, small kidneys and a few with larger kidneys here. And you can see the kidney size in the, the Mayo Clinic Biobank population is, is fairly small. So I think that uh, there's good evidence of an association between ALG8 and, and ALG9 uh, and a cystic phenotype, but it's clearly not uh, a fully penetrant uh, phenotype. So what about uh, single PKHD1 changes? Uh, well, there's been suggestion of these being associated with both a, a liver and a, and a kidney uh, phenotype. So uh, we try to identify all the known pathogenic and likely pathogenic uh, changes in uh, PKHD1 that have been identified in ARPKD cases or other cases that were loss of uh, function. Um, we looked at these in the Mayo Clinic Biobank and found a thousand individuals with these uh, changes. So about one in 53 individuals is a carrier for a single PKHD1 change. So this is uh, kind of in the ballpark of uh, the suggested carrier frequency for PKHD1 around uh, one in 70 uh, individuals. We can see here um, 594 of these had imaging. Um, we uh, used some analysis of the clinical records to try and find which ones had kidney or liver cysts mentioned in the radiological report. And you can see that 66.8% of these uh, had cysts mentioned. And if we, but if we look at ICD codes, uh, we can see that uh, six only 6.6% of these um, were identified, mm -hmm. uh, were coded to have renal or liver cysts. Uh, we looked at some of these in a bit more detail, the ones with uh, truncating changes and the one that was with this um, common T36M uh, variant. And we could see that some of these have uh, multiple cysts uh, within, the, uh, within the kidney. But again, there's quite a lot which ha either have uh, no cysts in the kidney or a small number. And if we look at the number that have more than 10 cysts, is about 10% uh, in each of these two uh, populations. If we look at liver cysts, we see a similar picture where some patients have multiple cysts uh, within the liver, um, but the majority uh, have a rather small number or no cysts within the, in the liver. And here we can see the, uh, the level in this population is uh, around what we see or a little bit higher maybe than for, for kidney cysts. We need to look at really a control population to, to look at the significance of these. But I think there is evidence for PKHD1 changes causing kidney and liver cysts. But, but again, the level of penetrance uh, for uh, um, significant disease in, 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 in terms of cyst number may be only about 10% of the patients. We can see here some examples 
of the cysts within the liver in these patients. Some of them have pretty uh, large cysts within the, within the kidney. You can see here one individual with a, a, trunk, uh, a nonsense mutation with PKH to one having much more severe disease. But we found that this patient also has a, a, a lightly pathogenic change in, in, in PKD, PKD1. So this is raises the, the possibility that PKHD1 changes, which are quite common within the population, could be a, a significant modifier of the ADPKD uh, phenotype. Although that's not cl that clear here with renal failure at, at 68 years in this of age, but this individual has a missense change and we're not uh, sure about the uh, penetrance of that particular change. One thing that we've uh, also started to do and is certainly a work in progress right now is to try and look at which genes are significantly enriched uh, for uh, cysts in their uh, kidney, um, either by, uh, this is looking at uh, the um, uh, ICD codes, um, seeing if they're um, enriched in uh, for particular genes compared to uh, um, patients that don't have any loss of function changes in PKD or ciliopathy genes. And we can see here uh, uh, PKD1 and PKD2, uh, 663, because we also look for uh, uh, cysts in the, in the kidney, in the liver here, IFT140. I have to, uh, the COL4A4 is also a gene, but we can see some genes such as the PDR19, uh, another uh, ciliopathy gene enriched in this population. So we're hoping that this is going to be a way to identify new genes that might be uh, associated with kidney and or uh, liver cysts. And likewise, if we look for the description of cysts within radiological reports, we can see some similar genes here, PKD1, PKD2, IFT140, now IFT172, and again, WDR19, uh, coming up within this population. So well, we think that uh, this work needs some refinement, but it may be a way of identifying uh, new genes associated with, uh, with ADPKD. So I hope you've been able to uh, uh, to show you that the major genes, PKD1 and PKD2, appear to have a high level of penetrance when we uh, look at them in uh, control populations. If we look at uh, other nine genes that have been associated or suggested to be associated with ADPKD, we can see they're mainly associated with mild disease. And, uh, and the, the level of penetrance seems to be uh, variable between them, but, but it's not uh, complete. Obviously, these large sequence populations can help us to work out this penetrance from the preliminary data we've done already. Uh, IFT140, ALG8, and ALG9 seem to uh, so show a relationship here, but there's uh, obviously uh, um, lower penetrance in terms of uh, the number of cysts in the kidney, and especially for CKD, although this may be a little higher for for ALG9. And uh, look at him, we're still, I think, working at PKHT1 to look at the, the penetrance of these single changes. And I think developing uh, better ways to, to look at this uh, population uh, to identify cystic phenotypes should be a way to identify new genes as well as uh, clarifying the penetrance of the, the genes that we know. So I just want to thank the individuals in my loop, my group here, especially Doa, has done a lot of the work, and Hannah and Rachel here have done a lot of the the genetic work. Uh, Tabinda did a lot of uh, earlier work on the ALG8 and ALG9 uh, uh, um, studies, and also others, the bioinformatics team here, the radiology team, our clinical investigators here uh, at uh, at Mayo. And also want to thank the uh, investigators involved in the multi-center ALG8 and ALG9 studies that we've been in, uh, involved in. So uh, uh, just want to thank you and uh, happy to take questions.
Right, thank you, Peter. Uh, this is now open for questions. And so if you just raise your hand, um, we will call on you to hopefully you can unmute yourself. There may be a debate whether you can actually do that. I'm going to start off with a question while hands are being raised. Um, I'm curious on the IFT variants that you'd have identified. Um, and I assume that those are all heterozygous. And then you have some that have phenotypes and some that don't. Have you been able to go through the genome sequences of those to see if there's another ciliary-related mutation somewhere in the background, you know, getting back to Nico Costanz's uh, overall genetic mutational load in cilia genes and contributing to phenotypes? Yeah, we've not really been able to show that. And I have to say with IFT uh, 172, we're only starting to dig into that data. You know, with IFT 140, there are are suggestions of other variants, <clears throat> not only cilia ones, I don't think, especially there, you know, variants in PKD1, considering how close by it is and how it co-segregates that, that might be contributing to the phenotype. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for all of these, we, we suppose that there's other variants that are um, uh, contributing to a much more severe phenotype. I think it is it is interesting that we get, you know, a group with a quite significant phenotype and then, you know, a larger group with a much milder phenotype. So other genetic variants, and as you say, genetic load would make sense there, but uh, we haven't really teased that apart yet. And it probably needs quite, uh, uh, quite a lot of analysis to see if we can uh, um, really identify other variants that might be causing the more severe disease. Thank you. David. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if you've done the converse experiment, looking at uh, populations and individuals who might have unambiguous protein truncating mutations and yet are not clinically affected. Uh, yeah, we've tried to do that for PKD1 and PKD2, I think, as I I've tried to show you and there, uh, once we got the ones rid of the ones that we think were probably spurious uh, loss of function variants, we see a very high level of penetrance. I think once we come to missense changes, it's obviously going to be a little bit more difficult, uh, um, especially in, the, in knowing that some uh, variants are hypomorphic alleles and associated with milder disease, but we're trying to pull them out today as well to look at the, the penetrance of them. For the other genes, I mean, it does seem like there's a fairly high level of individuals with loss of function variants without uh, a clear phenotype, even for genes like IFT140, where uh, at least from the family studies, we thought uh, the, the penetrance were, was moderately high. So I, I think, and, and as we we're just discussing with with Brad, I, I guess there's other genetic variants here that are that are making a difference to whether uh, we're seeing a phenotype or not. Yeah, but I mean, yes, you'd certainly, uh, based on what we know, we expect the penetrance to be high in uh, the people carrying uh, definitive pro uh, truncating mutations. But if you found real carriers that uh, do not have disease, those represent people who are potentially genetically resistant to the disorder. And that's been productive in a variety of other cases of, of you know, you, you want to study those people. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're on the lookout for those people. It's just, at least for PKD1 and PKD2, we haven't really seen them yet. I mean, it depends on uh, on what you define as uh, the phenotype. But here, they had to have a, um, they had a, a diagnosis of ADPKD, and they had at least 20 cysts. Uh, within the within the kidney, I think all of the ones with the with the truncating uh, PKD one and um, PKD two uh, changes. Right, uh, so you have to go to populations which are not ascertained on virtue of the of having kidney disease. Mm -hmm. and there are, you know, the the uh, UK biobank and all kinds of other uh, population studies. Right. I mean, we are, we have tried to do that. I mean, we pulled out 
use looking at the genotype ones with loss of function changes, PKD1, PKD2, where we have imaging, gone back to look at those. Um, but uh, pretty much all of them have turned out to be in our defined ADPKD uh, population. So we're on the lookout for those changes, but I, I would say we haven't really found them yet. Thanks, Shridhar. Uh, yes, first, first of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, such a great update uh, in ADPKD. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned uh, about different uh, genes and phenotypes uh, in kidneys uh, from cohort, right? Uh, I'm wondering that, uh, did you find uh, any uh, reduced size in the kidney? Uh, one is reduced in size and another is uh, with cyst. cyst, cyst uh, did you find the reduced size of the kidney? Uh, the reduced size of the kidney? Yeah, I mean, uh, one uh, uh, one kidney is in normal size with cyst and another is very small size. So did you find like this in any uh, samples or patient? Uh, we find, we well, in you know, in clinical populations, we certainly see patients like that. I can't remember seeing one in the Mayo Clinic Biobank uh, very much like that. I mean, certainly we, you know, we think that mosaicism can be a, a cause of that where the variant, you know, occurs at a, a later stage and is more common in one kidney uh, than the other. Uh, although that's not always that easy to, um, you know, determine because Often, if it, if the change occurs at a later stage, we don't see it in uh, you know blood DNA or buccal DNA. Uh, um, and analysis of urine DNA can sometimes be helpful in 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 patients like that. So I think that can be a reason for either unilateral or uh, asymmetric disease between the kidneys. Okay, okay, okay. thank you, Jane. Um, hi. Um, well, good to see you, Peter, um, virtually, and uh, uh, thank you for the nice review. Um, I heard maybe uh, I missed something that you mentioned in some cases uh, there is no cysts. So I, I, uh, I just wonder whether you can sort of uh, summarize or, uh, you know, briefly summarize that in terms of all the cilia genes you looked at, uh, whether some of them are associated with the lack of uh, uh, renal cysts. Well, I think the majority, you know, we haven't been of ciliopathy genes. We haven't seen a clear monoallelic phenotype at the moment. It seems like only in, uh, you know, unusual cases. I mean, for IFT140, I think it's fairly clear, um, you know, we speculate about IFT172, but there's more work to do there. And I, we're still looking to see if there's others where there seems to be a modern Lelic phenotype. But I would say for the majority of, of uh, ciliopathy genes, I don't think, you know, it's likely that there's going to be a, a mono allelic uh, uh, phenotype. I mean, it is an unusual situation where the dosage reduction of the gene in itself will be enough to cause a, a phenotype, I I think. And, uh, and so, I mean, we were probably surprised in the first place to find IFT140 as a as a PKD gene, as you know, the others that have been associated with ADPKD have mainly been associated with glycosylation, folding, and trafficking of proteins, which uh, are thought maybe to directly work through um, PKD1, not uh, trafficking efficiently. Uh, but what the mechanism here is, is I think is not uh, completely uh, so clear, especially, you know, that they have a a kidney <clears throat> a phenotype, sometimes a bit of a, a liver phenotype, uh, but not a broad phenotype as we see in the in the biallelic cases uh, where we're seeing the the loss of function and then uh, you know the pleiotropic changes that we see. And what are usually the age of these patients? 
Well, the, the age of the patients here uh, we've been looking at actually, actually are pretty old because patients in the Mayo Clinic Biobank are pretty old. I mean, I think there's a kind of plus and a minus to that. A plus, you know, they have a chance for, uh, a, you know, reduction of these uh, genes to, to be having a phenotypic effect. But you start getting an overlap with, you know, simple cysts that start to develop more commonly in, in older individuals. And so I think in the individuals over 70 and maybe especially over 80, it becomes more difficult to know whether you're really seeing, you know, a genetic cause of cysts or uh, a, an age-related uh, simple cyst uh, phenomenon. I got a couple. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Jing, too. <laughs> uh, <Bishop. laughs> hi, hi Peter uh, so I raised my hand first and I put it back down and <laughs> then I raised it again because I, in the end I thought there is no such thing as a stupid question can you uh, <laughs> summarize the discussion about the with the uh, with the first question are you are we you say high penetrance with pkd1 truncation but you don't give a number so can you tell us and we will not, I will not quote you anywhere else, but can you tell us, is it 100% penetrance with a PKD1 truncating mutation? That's question number one. And then what are your thoughts about PKD1 pathogenic, but non-truncating uh, mutation and the penetrance of that? So in this rather small cohort, um, and disregarding the ones that we think are not really loss of function because of coincident uh, inheritance of other variants. Yes, we do see 100% uh, penetrance of an ADPKD uh, phenotype. You know, it's not that many uh, patients, though. Um, I think for uh, missense, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a tough one because I think we're going to see a, a broad range, you know, as we do in, in clinical populations. Um, uh, you know, I think that we're, there's missense changes that we think are uh, as just as penetrant as um, <clears throat> a, a truncating change. And that's probably because they just don't fold up and traffic at all. Um, but we haven't really looked at them yet. And we're kind of getting to that. But we're also trying to look at hypomorphic alleles like R3277C, you know, in a in a population like this, do they have cysts within the within the kidney? Presumably, as again, it's going to be uh, a partially penetrant phenotype, I would guess, where there's some cysts, uh, but maybe not many. Some may don't have cysts at all, but maybe I shouldn't speculate too much as we didn't really look yet. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting, though, to help determine whether some missense changes are pathogenic or not. I mean, there's some that, uh, you know, are recurrently found in this population. Already, we're very suspicious that they're not really uh, pathogenic changes, even if they've been described as such. So I think the population will help us to uh, differentiate them. But, you know, it's a bit of a chicken and egg, I guess. If we throw out the ones we don't find a phenotype, then we might be missing other ones that are that are not fully penetrant at, at times, and 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 so we need to be uh, careful about that. And probably we can only make clearer decisions on kind of recurrent changes. But uh, I think it will be interesting to look at uh, uh, missense changes in PKD1. We're we're trying to make a definitive list of pathogenic changes, but it's not quite as easy as I thought. It never is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are right at the hour. Um, so I'm going to bring this to a close, Peter. Thank you very much um, for your seminar. Um, and thank you for all the wonderful questions, guys. I love the discussion. So Peter, thank you again. And uh, see everybody next month. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Bye.